Okay, let's open up our Bibles to Jeremiah chapter 1. I think I'm going to keep the same theme through the whole 52 chapters of Jeremiah. And the reason is, is because it's about Jeremiah and his ministry to the children of Judah, their Israel. And when you think about the call of Jeremiah, the work of Jeremiah, you would think that he was a failure. Because God called him, he responded to that call, but he didn't see any fruit from his ministry. There were no converts, nobody listened to him. Uh, They went off and did their own thing and went into captivity and God judged them. And so from our standards, you would say that Jeremiah was a failure because there was no fruit. There was no growth in his own ministry whatsoever. Um, I think of some of the ministries that are around today and and people who make judgment calls on those ministries. Um, They consider them to be failures because because of what they observe and think is success, like possibly growth or resources or more ministries. And yet, when you have the eyes of Christ, it has nothing to do with those things. It has to do with the faithfulness, the faith, listen to this, the faithfulness of the man. That's success. That really is success. How faithful Jeremiah was to his call, no matter what was going on around him. That is true success. That is true uh, fruit that God is looking for because God will not judge us on how big our ministries are, on how prosperous they are. He will judge us all based upon how faithful we were to what he's called us to do. And that is it. And we're going to talk a little bit about that tonight. So the theme... For the next 52 chapters is the weeping prophet. And he had a lot to weep about. Not only the fact that he didn't see any converts and no fruit there. And that's uh, something to weep about. I, I know many men who, who, who have seen one or two converts and, and are weeping saying, Boy, I really have no fruit in my life. Well, you got more than Jeremiah. You know, so you don't need to weep. You know. and, and, and then the people that were listening to him. Uh, really didn't listen to him. Uh, they didn't pay any attention. They thought he was a, a great orator, a speaker, and what he was saying was fine, but they walked away and they did not you know, apply what he had said. And so he had a lot of weeping over those that he ministered to, uh, hoping and praying and seeking God that they would just listen to the word of the Lord, but they wouldn't do it. And so he's known as a weeping prophet. A weeping prophet. And those of you that are in ministry uh, will understand that when you're trying to reach out to people with the truth and people reject it. It's a sad thing to see people's lives being destroyed or when you're reaching out in hopes that someone will come to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior and they reject it. And, and, And they sealed their faith for eternal damnation. And that's something to weep over. I know many of men that I have ministered to in hopes that they would uh, have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. They've even confessed Christ as their personal Savior, and then in time, they want nothing to do with Jesus Christ. In fact, they begin to call you names, hypocrite, and don't want anything to do with that Christianity garbage and, and all of these things, and that's sad because they miss the whole message of the gospel. And so the weeping prophet, Jeremiah, ministered in Judea during the last 40 years of the nation's history from 627 or perhaps 582 B.C. before Christ. He was roughly about 60 years after Isaiah, the prophet. Jeremiah is ministering to Judah who will be taken into captivity by Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar. And you can read the book of Daniel uh, concerning Nebuchadnezzar and the children of Israel that were taken into captivity there. In this chapter, we find the Lord said to Jeremiah, I appoint you as a prophet to the nations. And we're going to talk at length there a little bit about his calling. We, We shared a little bit about God's calling upon men from Galatians through the Apostle Paul. And so he's 
encouraging Jeremiah here not to be afraid. Don't worry. I'm with you. I will be with you. I will protect you. I will guide you. I will lead you. I will direct you. And so you don't have to fear whatsoever. I'm calling you to the northern kingdom against Judea. And he will describe his call in ministry here in chapter 1. Jeremiah records his message to Judea, pleading with the people to repentance from chapter 2 all the way to chapter 33. And then he shares some of his personal sufferings in chapter 34 through 45 as an outline, and then some sermons to the Gentile nations, 46 to 51. And then the last chapter reviews the fall of the city and the nation in chapter 52. So that's the outline of the whole book. Let's look at the call of Jeremiah, verse 1. The words of Jeremiah, the son of Hilkiah, of the priests who were in Athoth, in the land of Benjamin. So here's a tribe Benjamin, Jeremiah comes from that tribe, a tribe that is involved with the priesthood. He is the son of Helikai, who was a priest. And so Jeremiah, in a sense, was a priest also, but also called as a prophet. And thus we get the word, the weeping prophet. Now, when Jesus was on the earth, the people identified him with the prophet er- Jeremiah. You remember that in Matthew sixteen fourteen, Jeremiah's life was not easy and his ministry did not appear to be very successful. And when you look at Jesus's ministry, it was very difficult also. And many thought that he could have been Jeremiah come back. But he was faithful to the Lord and accomplished God's will. And again, God looks at the faithfulness of the man or woman. He says in verse 2, To whom the word of the Lord came in the days of Josiah. Now, he's going to list some of the kings at the time and and, and how this all began. And I'll describe that in chapter 2 a little bit more. Uh, And so he lists these kings. Josiah was one of the kings. He was a good king. He was a young king. He was only eight years old. And the Lord called him to be a king. The son of Ammon, king of Judah, in the 13th year of his reign. And it came also in the days of Jehokim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, until the end of the 11th year of uh, Jedekiah, or Zedekiah, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, until the carrying away of Jerusalem, captivity in the fifth month. Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. I knew you. Now here's a phrase that is used also in Psalms 139. David uses it. Paul uses it in Galatians chapter 1 verse 15. Jeremiah here is basically saying that God told him that before I was formed, I, that God knew me in the womb. That is before his birth. Before he even existed, God knew him and had called him into this ministry of being a prophet to the children of Judah. Now that tells us a couple of things. That God knows the past and God knows the future. That God is in control and he has everything in his hands. If, if Jeremiah understood God correctly, he understood that his ministry, his calling was not of men, was not of his choice, but was of God before he was even born. Very clear. David said this in Psalms 139, 13. For you formed my inward parts. You formed my inward parts. Uh, Interesting psalm. I just happened to go to a hospital visit. And as I was at the hospital visit, uh, usually when I go to hospital visits, I usually go right to Psalms 23. It's the, the Lord's, the shepherd, you know, the, the shepherd's songs, uh, Psalms 23. Uh, it's a very comforting psalm and so forth. And so I usually go there, read it to, to those that are in the hospital and so forth, just to give them encouragement and then pray for them. Just something that I, f- I just do normally. Uh, but in this case, as, as I was listening to this person, I... I the Lord just really touched my heart that God was doing a work in their lives and that he was literally changing uh, their mindset. Uh, This person was very hard to the gospel. Uh, This person would have never hugged me or really had a conversation with me or even really uh, uh, hold a conversation about Christ or Christianity whatsoever. Uh, They have always rejected it. Uh, They have openly said, 
I'm in control. I don't need that garbage, in a sense. And then all of a sudden, they're in the hospital, not in control, and their mind is so different that I can see there's a personality change. In fact, I even asked his wife, I said, did you notice a personality change? And she said to me, yeah, it's slightly, he's a little different. And so the Lord gave me this psalm to read to him that the Lord knows him completely. When you read the whole psalm, it talks about knowing his sitting downs, his rising ups. He knows his inner parts. And so I I kind of approached him very carefully after everyone was, was talking for a while. And I basically said, could I read a scripture to you? And you know what he did? He said, yes, please read it to me. I want to hear it. And I'm like, I just kind of like blown away because he never would have responded that way. And so I read this Psalm and I said, you know, because of my injury and because I've seen other people uh, hurt who have thought that they were in control of their lives, realize that they're not in control of their lives. I go, do you feel that way? He goes, yeah, completely. I go, yeah. I thought I was in control but when I got hurt I realized I'm not in control you're not in control but there is someone who is in control and that's God because he formed your inward parts he knows you're sitting down he knows you're rising ups he knows everything about you your past your present and your future that's the God that we serve we have to believe that you have to believe that otherwise you, you will not get through life you will suffer you will worry you'll be concerned about everything that happens to you When you realize that God already knows, he already understands, he already has a plan, then there's comfort and peace there that God has a plan for your life. And and as I shared that psalm with him, he said, let me hug you. And he just gave me this big hug, and then he wouldn't let me go. You know, and I kind of felt awkward now because now he's hugging me, and that's just not the person. And the Lord really told me, I'm changing his mind. God can do that. God can do that. And I just see God working in this person's life. Paul understood this also, Galatians 1.15. This is what Paul said. But when it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb and called me through his grace. It pleased God to call the apostle Paul before he was even born. While he was in his mother's womb, God said, Paul, Saul at the time, Your parents will call you Saul. I will change your name to Paul. You will become an apostle to the Gentiles and I will use you in a mighty way. And he wasn't even born yet. That's amazing to me. It is a calling of God and not of men. As you continue to read in Galatians, you were here at the men's study Monday night. We realized that men don't call us. God calls us. And if God calls you, then that calling is irrevocable. God doesn't make mistakes. He knows what he's doing. And in fact, when you look at all the men that God calls, he always calls people that that aren't really well educated, don't have the ability, uh, question themselves, you know, uh, doubts and so forth. And usually that's the man that God calls. Remember Moses? I can't speak, Lord. Remember David? He didn't even care. He was out tending the sheep. He figured, I'm not one of my brothers. And God went to him. The apostle Paul said, I'm not like Apollo. I don't have eloquent speaking. Peter and John, the religious leaders were looking at him saying, like, who are these guys? They don't even know how to speak. You know, they're uneducated men. And yet God used them. Those are the men that God uses. Why? So that God gets the glory. God gets the glory. If an educated man comes in and says, God, you need me, then who's getting the glory if anything happens? They are and not God. These are the men that God uses, and he uses them in mightily ways because he's called them. He says, you covered me in my mother's womb. Before you you were born, I sanctified you. I ordained you a prophet to the nations. Be careful. Be careful that you don't judge those that are called to the ministries. It is God who calls them, not you. And just because you don't like them and because you don't like what they're saying doesn't mean that God hasn't called them. You don't like the fact that they don't use certain words or they're not educated or they come from a bad background or, or, or you know, their philosophy, their styles and so forth. It doesn't matter because God called all kinds of people. 
from fishermen to zealots to tax collectors, you know, to educated and uneducated men. It's God's calling, not ours. And for us to say, oh, that guy's not called to the ministry. He's the problem. He's an issue. No, no. He just needs to be faithful and trust in God because it is God who calls and sanctifies the person. And he ordained him as a, as a minister. Now, it's interesting because... Um, it's interesting how men will push their way into the ministry because they have some sort of idea. We just had a friend that um, literally, good, nice guy, loved the guy. He's nothing wrong with him at all, but I guess he, he was just so zealous for his, his daughter's uh, marriage that he went to the state of California and got ordained so he can marry her. You know, and it's just to me that's like, okay, why didn't you go God's way and use God's man, you know, and, and not go through all of that just so that you could marry your daughter? That's that's doing your own thing, you know. That's not even using. It's not even a a, a marriage that is sanctioned by by God's uh, prophet or. or pastor or, or you know he decided i'm just going to go to the state of california and do it myself guess what during the tribulation period there's going to be a state religion you know and, and they're going to know all these things these are men that take control and do their things their way and not god's way and that's sad because they miss the whole point they don't see it and they're the ones that end up suffering i had another guy that uh, uh used to actually be here and we had ordained him, and when he left, he lost his ordination because you are ordained by, the, by that church. And also, according to the law, you are under that corporation. So when you leave that ministry, you are no longer ordained by that ministry. And so he wasn't ordained by us. But in his own mind, I can do my own thing, he went on and he was continually marrying people. And he wasn't even ordained. And he was signing the the marriage certificates and everything as though he was an ordained minister. And he came to me uh, years later and said, hey, I'd like to get one of those ordination cards. I go, for what? He goes, oh, because I'm going to be marrying somebody and I just want to make sure I got a card so that they ask me for it. I says, you're not ordained here. He says, what, what do you mean? I go, you're not ordained by us. I go, I hope you haven't married anyone since you left. He goes, oh, yeah, I have. I go, I hope they don't catch you then. <laughs> you know, because you're not ordained. And it's, these are the men that do their own thing, that aren't really doing it according to God. God hasn't called them. It's their own appointment and their own decision to do these type of things. That's not what Jeremiah is saying here. It is God who called me. It is God who ordained me. It is God who sanctified me. The word sanctification means separation. God is working in their lives. And God is working in those men that God calls in their lives. Verse 6, Then said I, Jeremiah, Ah, Lord God, behold, I cannot speak, for I am a youth. So again, here's the attitude of a man that's really called. I can't speak. I, I don't know what I'm saying. You know, this really brings comfort to me because I know I'm not the most educated person. I don't know. I know I don't use the greatest grammar. And like Jeremiah, you know, he said, God, I can't even speak. And not only that, I'm a youth. You know, it's like I don't have this, this education, you know, I don't have this wisdom as older people, people do, but God is saying, but I've called you, and I'm going to use you and no one else. But the Lord said to me, do not say I am a youth, for you shall go to all to whom I send you, and whatever I command you, you shall speak. Do not be afraid of their faces, for I am with you to deliver you, saith the Lord." Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth, and the Lord said to me, Behold, I have put my words in your mouth. See, I have this day set you over the nations and over the kingdoms to root out and to pull down, to destroy and to throw down, to build and to plant. Interesting. God said, I'm using you as an instrument. I will put the words in your mouth. I will be the great physician and you will be the tool. Don't worry about your youth. Don't worry about what you're going to say. I will, I will say it for you, and I will throw this phone away. <laughs> and I will um, take care of everything else. I like what Chuck Smith said as I was listening to his commentary. He said that when he was younger, <clears throat> well, and this was probably uh, several years ago as his 2000 series, so he wasn't that young. But he said that he was not a very tactful person. And he said, and he was basically saying, I still 
basically am not. I, I don't really like going around the bush I just say it the way it is I think it's true and so I just I'll just say it and so he said when he started his ministry he was just that way just very straightforward and and people would get upset all of the time uh, because of that lack of tactfulness that um, that he had and he tells a few stories and so forth but he realized that that's the person that God called to the ministry and God has a way of rooting out and pulling out those people that don't understand the call of the ministry and that have a different agenda to the ministry. And he will root those people out and he will then build a fresh new thing. It's interesting because uh, several years ago in this ministry, uh, we were joining several Calvary chapels and doing a whole week of prayer and fasting here at the church. And so we were fasting every day and we were praying every night and we were here at the church and just uh, going along with this. And the Lord gave me a a prophecy that many people from the church were going to leave. And so I just shared it with the body. I didn't know who it was. Uh, I didn't point anybody out. I just said the Lord just really spoke to me very clearly that a lot of people are leaving. And when they leave, God is going to bless this church. And it was so interesting. I started uh, telling some other pastors, uh, friends of mine and so forth, so they were praying for me. And they thought I was a little bold saying that, you know, uh, because it was a little bold because I didn't know. But it was clear that that's what the Lord said during this time of praying and fasting. And sure enough, within the six months, at that time we had about, 60 people in the church or so and I would say a good 10 families left just boom 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 started leaving and I had the perfect peace about it other people didn't they were concerned they thought the ministry was over they started blaming people and so forth you know and just various things like this but I had this perfect peace because God already told me they were going to leave and he was going to bless and as soon as they all left boom the Lord blessed all of a sudden He started adding more. And now we have, if everyone were to come, especially during summertime, we probably have 170 people coming to this church, almost 200 people. And so when God told Jeremiah that he roots out and he pulls down to destroy and to throw down, but to build and to plant. And you have to do that sometimes. You have to get rid of people that just aren't doing anything in order to replant and in order to grow again. You don't leave the same plants in uh, when you plant annuals in the ground because eventually they just stay there, they look dull, they don't really attract, and they wither away and they just die. And they need to be pulled out, thrown away, and replanted so that new stuff begins to grow. And in a sense, it's a pruning that takes place within the body of Christ. Now, that doesn't mean that the people that left are bad. I'm not saying that, so don't jump to conclusions. God moves them to other places where they can hopefully grow and maybe learn from that situation, you know. That's what I'm saying is God moves them around so that hopefully God will wake them up and they will begin to grow in these other places. And so he moves people around. So God now asks Jeremiah, what do you see? He says, moreover, verse 11, the word of the Lord came to me saying, Jeremiah, what do you see? And I said, I see a branch of an almond tree. Then the Lord said to me, you have seen well, for I am ready to perform my word. And the word of the Lord came to me a second time saying, what do you see? And I said, I see a boiling pot. Now we'll see this in verse 14. And it is facing away from the north. And the Lord said to me, out of the north, calamity shall break forth on all the inhabitants of the land. So God's preparing him, preparing his heart, for what is about to take place with the children of Israel. That from the north, that is from Babylon, great calamity is about to come upon them. For behold, I'm calling all the families of the kingdoms of the north, says the Lord. They shall come, each one set his throne at the entrance of the gates of Jerusalem against all its walls all around and against all the cities of Judah. I will utterly or I will utter my judgments against them concerning all their wickedness because they have forsaken me, burned incense to other gods, and worshiped the works of their own hands. He's warning them. 
he's encouraging Jeremiah, look, this is what's going to happen, so prepare yourself. Don't be afraid. Don't worry. I'm going to call this nation Babylon. They're going to come down right at the gates of Jerusalem, but it's not because I hate them. It's because they hate me, because they're into idolatry, because they're into sin, because they have forsaken me. They're depending on their own works and their own hands. I'm going through a series right now by... Do- by um, Bob Hoskra, and it's about the grace of God, living by the grace of God. And he talks about the law, the law of God, and how we're not under the law anymore, and we're not to live by the law, but we're to live by grace. And grace basically is favor, God's favor, that when we serve the Lord, it's all done by grace. Grace, God's favor upon our lives, not because we deserve it, not because we can somehow Uh, manipulate it or we can add to it with our abilities or because of our faithfulness and so forth it's all because of God's grace that he pours his blessings upon us and yet here are these people that God says that they are worshiping the works of their own hands of their own hands I've seen so many people come into ministry and they have so many promises the works of their own hands And every time they come in speaking that way, I always see them leaving with nothing in their hands because it's just their works and their works will never last. It is God's work that lasts. It's God's work that will continue on because it's God doing the work and not us. Over and over again, I've seen that. Therefore, prepare yourself and rise and seek to them Or speak to them all that I command you. Do not be dismayed before their faces, lest I dismay you before them. So in a sense, uh, God is saying, look, Jeremiah, you're going to have to confront these people. I know it's going to be difficult, but but don't speak straight to them face to face. In other words, look down and and speak with humility, but don't look at them. Because if you look at them, you're going to get discouraged, and then you might then be dismayed also so just speak to them because this is going to be a hard message and you have to brace yourself you're just going to have to trust in me for behold i have made you jeremiah this day a fortified city and an iron pillar and bronze walls against the whole land against the kingdom of judah against the prince against the priests against the people of the land i mean talk about having enemies right pretty much everybody is going to be against you jeremiah nobody's going to like you, nobody's going to want to talk to you. I mean, all odds are against you, Jeremiah, completely. They will fight against you, Jeremiah, but they shall not prevail against you, for I am with you, Jeremiah, says the Lord, to deliver you. I love that. The Lord is with you. It is him who is with us. Moses didn't feel adequate for what God wanted to do in his life. In fact, there was a point where Moses said, I can't even speak, Lord, and, and so you're going to have to use someone else. And so God says, okay, I'll use Aaron then. But you're still going to be the, the man in the forefront, but I'll use Aaron to speak. You know? And so he missed out. But God was with him. The apostle Paul, he said, who is sufficient for these things? He realized that in his own strength and abilities, he wasn't sufficient. He had all the teachings in the world. He had all the abilities. He was a Pharisee of Pharisees, studied in all the greatest schools, read all the greatest books. But he said, that's nothing. That's nothing. Who is sufficient for the, th- for the very work of God? And he answers uh, his own question by saying, our sufficiency is from God, 2 Corinthians 4, 5. Our sufficiency is from God, not from anything else. But we make a big mistake when we think that that we have the answers, that our ways is the correct way, when our sufficiency is all in the hands of God Almighty, just trusting in Him. It is a difficult thing, but it is a blessing to see God work that way. When people don't agree with you, when people don't like you because of decisions you're making, but then to see God protecting you, leading you, and then blessing you. It's a neat place to be, but a hard place to be at the same time in the hands of God because ultimately we have to depend on the sufficiency of God alone and nothing else. When God calls you to do a task for him, he does not ask you to be adequate. He only asks you to be available. 
to be available. Now, that doesn't mean that, um, that you make all the right decisions. By all means, no. That's not what, what I am saying nor what God is saying. What God is saying is that you are faithful to come before him and say, look, I've messed up. I just want to continue to serve you, so continue to use me. And, and he sees that type of heart. And that's why he blesses compared to the heart that's proud, the heart that says, I've got the answers, the heart that says, I can do it with my own works and hands. And if we just do this and do that and do this and do this and everything's going to be fine. Uh, no. See, God can't use that person. They got too many abilities. God just wants a humble person that's willing to say, just do what I ask you to do and be faithful to it. Now we come to chapter 2. This is prophetic message here is dedicated to the southern kingdom of Judah, though sometimes it's referred to as Israel, so we see that interchange there, the words, with this capital city there in Jerusalem. Samaria and the northern kingdom had fallen to Assyria almost a century earlier. Uh, Why was judgment coming upon the nation of Judah? Because the people were unfaithful to God and had mixed the worship of God, Jehovah, with the worship of heathen idols. Nothing different than today, right? You go back, you know, 600 and something years before Christ, and they're worshiping idols. They're, they're into the culture. They're doing what everybody else is doing. You come to the time of Christ, B.C. or A.D. 1, you know, and you have the religious leaders. You have Rome, and they're all worshiping their idols, and they're all worshiping their own ways and their own gods and doing their own things. And now you come to 2014, and guess what? We're still doing the same thing. Nothing's changed. We still worship intellect. We still worship our our own abilities. We still worship what we think is right in our eyes and not what God says. It's the same problems back then as it was in the time of Christ as it is today, is that we put things before Christ. We put things before Christ. Religion was very popular in Judah, but it was not spiritual. Verse one, as we see, Israel has been a faithless spouse to God in the rest of this chapter. Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me saying, go and cry in the hearing of Jerusalem, saying, thus says the Lord. Now this is his first message to the children of Israel here. I remember you, the kindness of your youth, the love of your betrothed, when you went after me in the wilderness, in the land not sown, God is saying, look, I remember you when you loved me. I remember you when you were in the wilderness and I took you there and you went after me and you wanted to know me, but something happened. It kind of reminds you of Revelation where he's speaking to the church of Ephesians, Ephesus, right? And says, you know, you have all these wonderful things, but this one thing I I have against you is you've lost your first love. You don't love me anymore the way you used to love me. Uh, Israel was holiness to the Lord, the first fruits of his increase. All that devoured him uh, will offend. Disaster will come upon them, says the Lord. I mean, everything that Israel did was to keep that nurturing relationship with God. Even their offerings, as he said, they offered of their first fruits. They gave of their offerings. They tithed to the Lord because they knew that everything was God. He had brought them into the promised land. He had protected them. He had, he, he had kept his promises and, and so forth. And so they were so appreciative that they basically loved him deeply. But then something happened. They lost their first love. They got comfortable. Life went on. Trials came in. Uh, they felt God was at a distance. They f- felt God wasn't helping. And so they began to seek other gods and other means of help and strength and so forth. And all of a sudden now God is saying, I have to bring disaster upon you. I have to judge you. Verse 4, hear the word of the Lord, O house of Jacob, and all the families of the house of Israel. Thus says the Lord, what injustice have your fathers found in me? In other words, what did I do wrong to you? What have I done to you? I've only loved you, I've cared for you, Uh, I've provided for you, I've done everything for you, that they have gone far from me, have followed idols, and have become idolaters. It's interesting how how people 
um, will fall away from the Lord. And I, I always see that picture of backsliding state as Peter. You know, here he's following Jesus, you know, at a distance, you know, and then he's denying Jesus, then he's pretty much cursing that he doesn't even know the guy. And you see that, that progression of falling away. You know, and so many times you see people, they're excited you know, about the Lord, and then they get into the ministry, and then they get dismayed, and then the next thing you know is they're, they're lukewarm, and then they're not coming to one service, and they're not coming to another service, and then they're slowly drifting away, and then the next thing you know is, where are they? What happened to them? I know, I haven't seen them in a while. They're just gone. You know, and it's so sad when that happens. They're falling back into the world. Neither did they say, where is the Lord who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, who led us through the wilderness, through the land of deserts and pits through the land of drought and the shadows of death through the land that no one crossed and where no one dealt i brought you into a bountiful country to eat its fruit and its goodness but when you entered you defiled my land and made my heritage an abomination I mean, god poured his heart poured his blessings upon them he was there for them the priest did not say where is the lord and those who handle the law did not know me the rulers who transgressed against me, the prophets prophesied by Baal and walked after things that did or do not profit them at all. In other words, they completely left them over. Let me read to you the progression of what happened. When, Judah, when Judah's good king, Hezekiah, died, he was succeeded by his son, Manasseh. And under Manasseh, the nation became engrossed in idolatry. See, it's the leadership. It is the leadership that leads the people. And when you have bad leadership, you will have bad people. So important that you have good leadership and leadership that follows the Lord, that is example of the Lord, and that leads his people through the Lord, no matter what. When Manasseh took over, he led the people into idolatry. They began to worship Baal. Pagan altars were built, children were sacrificed to Moloch, worship of stars was instituted, and all of this idolatry took place. Who opens up the floodgates to murdering children? Our leadership. Obama just put in a lot of money into Planned Parenthood. You know, women's choice kills more babies than all the wars put together. Every single day, hundreds and hundreds of babies are being killed. And that's because of our leadership. Now, you can go ahead and make the argument that girls and women are going to do this even if we don't pay for it. I understand that. I understand that. That's their choice to do so. We don't have to pay for it, though. We should stand up for righteousness and for what is right. And people that are going to do the wrong thing are going to do the wrong thing no matter what. You know, we're not responsible for their actions, but we are when we're paying for it and making it so available to those that do get pregnant because of their own pleasures and they don't want a child, so they go and have an abortion so that they can continue on living their lifestyle and not have the burden of a baby at all. I think of, uh, I was just telling my granddaughter Gabriella uh, just the other day um, I can't remember what brought it on but we were we were talking about abortion and I was talking about how we were cl that close to getting my son Modesto aborted I mean, we had been to the Planned Parenthood place one time and it was closed what would have happened if it would have been open he wouldn't be here and then I looked at her and I said wow you wouldn't be here you wouldn't be here that's devastating. Think about those that aren't here. We don't know who they are, but they could have been here. That's deep. The prophets were persecuted. That is, the religious leaders were persecuted that stood up for God. They were not looked at as respectable men. Today, you know, pastors are nothing. Not like in the, the early... Uh, part of our nation when, when pastors were really the ones leading the people, not even the government was leading the people, it was the pastors directing and guiding them in spiritually and even in the world. But today now, it's like, who are they? We don't even want to support them. In fact, the government's trying to take away some of the liberties that pastors have to this day. 
prophets are persecuted. Same thing happening today. Traditions has it that Isaiah was sown in half in his air because he was preaching the truth. It was very hard times. During Manasseh's administration, the people of Judah did more evil than their heathen neighbors. The, the, the children of Israel were more wicked than the other nations. That's bad. You look at the church today, and it is so corrupt at what's going on in the church. There's only a remnant of true believers in the church itself. Manasseh was taken as a prisoner to Assyria. There he became... Or there he came to his senses and repented of his evil. And when he turned to Israel, to Jerusalem, he tried to undo the spiritual damage he had done. But he could not uh, uh, turn the tide of idolatry. And when the ruler died, he was succeeded by his son Ammon, who, was qu- who quickly reinstituted the wicked practices of his fathers of these earlier days. So they were even more wicked as he followed... Uh, his father's practices. Ammon was followed by Josiah, <coughs> who was Judah's last good king. And Josiah became, began to seek Jehovah when he was but 16 years old. And by the time he was 20, he was able to purge the land of idolatry. One of the projects was to even repair the temple of God. During his uh, enterprise, a copy of sacred laws was discovered. Then when the king noted the contrast between the pure religion described by the Masonic law and the corrupt practices of the current Hebrews, he uh, instituted a great reformation, which, uh, however noble, was but sacrificial or superficial and temporal. And the nations uh, was on a headlong course of destruction. And it was just a matter of time. And during this era of Josiah's reign was when Jeremiah came. It was too late because of uh, his fathers that brought evil into the land. Now you might say that it might be too late for us. And some will tell you, yeah, I think it is too late for the church today. That we're spiraling down and it is going to get worse it's going to get worse i just read an article that uh, someone's pushing for obama to run in 2016 that he should have the right to continue on what he's doing because he's doing great things that's interesting i read another article where police officers now when they do their radar checks on cars they can tell if you're texting they can tell if you're texting they can read uh, the phone that you're using while you're driving Obamacare says that in three years, everyone's supposed to have chips in their bodies to have all their information. If you have medical, you're going to get a chip. Now take one of those radars, point it at the car. Not only can they read if you're texting, they know who you are and everything about you because the chip's implanted in you. I mean, we're headed in that direction. The end is coming. Men's hearts are cold. That's one of the signs of the end times. We'll see that. In scripture, uh, the fact that men don't care about people anymore. They're just so self-centered, so selfish, that all they care about is themselves. And that's sad that we're living in those days. And these are the people that Jeremiah is ministering to. He says in verse 9, Therefore, I will yet bring charges against you, says the Lord, and against your children's children, I will bring charges. For pass beyond the coast of Cyprus... And see, send to Kedar, and consider diligently, and see if there has been such a thing. In other words, all the way from the west of Cyprus to the east of Cyprus, see if something has ever happened like this before. Has a nation changed its gods, which are not gods? But my people have changed their glory for that or for what does not profit in other words the glory their fellowship with me they gave that up for false idols that don't do a thing be astonished O heavens at this and be horribly afraid be very desolate says the lord for my people have committed two evils they have forsaken me the fountain of living waters and hewed themselves cisterns broken cisterns that can hold no water they've they 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 have forsaken god's grace and love and protection 
for cisterns that hold no water. Now, a cistern was basically a hole in the ground, and they would lace it with the limestone, and when there was enough water flowing from the rains and so forth, it would flow into the cistern, and then they would use a cistern to get their drinking water. It was a reservoir that they uh, built to hold the water so they could survive through, during the time where there was no rain. I've been down in those cisterns. They're pretty deep, they're really deep. They're huge. They can easily hold 200 people you know, down in there. I've walked down in there. Now they're just kind of empty, empty uh, holes, and they've got pigeon holes all over the place. The pigeons fly in there and so forth. But they're temporary. They aren't made to hold water. They are things that someone else made and they're broken. They don't last. And that God is saying, look, I have grace. I have living water for you. I have a way that's the right way. I have a way that will bless you. But you want a cistern. You want to do it your way. And your cistern doesn't even hold water. It's got cracks in it and the water leaks out. You know, eventually the water gets spoiled and you can't even drink it anymore. And you're waiting for the next rain to come so you can get some fresh water. And so you've traded me for that. Is Israel a servant? Is he a homeborn slave? Why is he plundered? The young lion roars at him and growls. They made his land waste. His cities are burned without inhabitants. Also the people of Naph and Tafnafi have broken the crown of your head. Have you not brought this on yourself in that you have forsaken the Lord your God when he led you in the way. Interesting, in the way. In the God's way, right? According to his principles. Then you come to the New Testament and Jesus now gives us the same principles but under grace and then people start calling the early Christians the way. You know, just like here in Jeremiah, the way. What does the way mean? God's way. We should be following God's way and not our way. And if you're not following God's way, guess what? You're following someone's way. And, and more than likely, it's a demonic way. Jesus told the religious leaders, you know, you're of your father the devil, and you do what your father does. So either you're doing it God's way or you're doing it Satan's way. You know, do it Satan's way, and it will lead to destruction verse 18 now why take the road to egypt to drink the waters of shahar or why take the road to assyria to drink the waters of the river your own wickedness will correct you and your backsliding will rebuke you know therefore and see that it is an evil and bitter thing that you have forsaken the lord your god and the fear of me is not in you says the Lord your God. The beginning of wisdom is the fear of the Lord. Boy, we need that more and more today. We don't fear the Lord anymore like we used to. This country doesn't fear the Lord anymore. You just look at television. There, there is no morality. There's no holiness. Holiness doesn't exist in, in, our, in our nation anymore. We have no idea what holiness is. When, when Peter says, be ye holy as I am holy, he's talking about God. How holy is God? <laughs> Can you ever be as holy as God? And yet Peter says, be holy like God is holy. That's something that we should be striving for, to be like our God, to be holy like him. And yet we don't, because we don't fear God. And we think that we will get away with it, and we won't. And we won't get away with it. We will suffer the repercussions of our unholiness. We need to speak more about holiness, about love <clears throat> for one another. God's love and God's holiness towards those things that destroy his people because they don't fear him. For of old I have broken your yoke and burst your bonds and you said I will not transgress when on every high hill and under every green tree you lay down playing the harlot. Now we know what a harlot is but he's speaking spiritually here not physically. You're not a prostitute, but you are living spiritually as a prostitute because you're prostituting yourselves to other things. 
you know, I'm going to get some wisdom. So I'll, I will open up the examiner and I'll look at the horoscope and see what it says is good for me today. That's pro- spiritual prostitution. You, you would rather hear from some person writing this down after looking and charting all these things for wisdom than God's word. You know what? I think I will go to a Christian psychologist and I will gain some wisdom. You, know? you might if he's one that only uses the word of God to give you wisdom, but chances are, you know, they probably aren't. And they're using the world's wisdom, uh, their observation of human, you know, response to certain conditions, you know, instead of just God's word that says, don't do that. Simple and clear. Oh, but that's too hard. But he's clear and God's giving you the Holy Spirit not to do that. But that's too hard. I'd rather talk about it with somebody that maybe will give me some insight to my birth and my parents and how mean they were to me and that's the whole reason that I'm like this because of my social uh, my society and my background where I grew up and all these things you know what you don't have to be that way anymore the Bible says you're a new creature in Christ Jesus the old things have passed away behold all things are new and so those things don't hold you anymore the Bible says and those are just excuses now so grow up live for the Lord put on the new man and we don't have to live that way we we commit spiritual adultery. Yet, he says in verse 21, I had planted you a noble vine, a seed of high quality. How then have you turned before me into the degenerate plant of an alien vine? For though you wash yourself with lye and use much soap, yet your iniquity is marked before me. In other words, it's in your heart. It's in your heart. Now that lie, they would take residue in the bottom of the lakes and they would make soap out of it. And he's basically saying, look, you you make soap and you scrub yourself like you're going to be clean on the outside. And some people do that. You know, they feel filthy. They feel like they've done something wrong. So they'll scrub themselves and they'll wash their hairs and make themselves almost bleed and they're red and so forth. And, oh, you know, I'm trying to get the filth off me. When God's saying the filth is not on the outside. The filth is in the heart. It is the heart that is bad. Change the heart and it will be good. How can you say I am not polluted? I have not gone after Baal. See your way in the valley. Know what you have done. You are a swift dormitory breaking loose in her way. A wild donkey used to the wilderness or yeah, wilderness that sniffs at the wind in her desire in her time of mating who can turn her away all those who seek her will not weary themselves in her month they will find her that's pretty descriptive <laughs> you know what he's saying there I mean that's pretty blunt for a prophet to say to people you're like a female donkey who's in heat and you're just looking for any male to come along you're sniffing to find somebody you know and boom there they come withhold your foot from being unshod and your throat from thirst but you said there is no hope no for I have loved aliens and after them I will go as a thief is a shame when he is found out, so is the house of Israel shame. They and their kings and their princes and their priests and their prophets saying to a tree, you are my father. Talk about tree huggers, right? There we go. Tree huggers, the environmentalists, you know, that, that say that the trees are God, that God is in everything. And God's saying, I'm not in a tree you say, that, you say to the tree that you're my father? It's like, no, I'm not the tree. And to a stone you gave birth to me, for they have turned their back to me and not their face. But in the time of their trouble, they will say, arise and save us. But where are your gods that you have made for yourselves? Let them arise. If they can save you 
in the time of your trouble, for according to the number of your cities are your gods, O Judah. In other words, you have a God in every city. You know, it's interesting when I was talking to this person um, that was in the hospital. Again, the whole whole idea, I remember sharing this was a while ago, and they, them saying, I'm in control of my own life. I make my own destiny. But when it comes right down to it, and they're in the hospital, who are they crying out to? They're crying out to God. Because they realize, I'm not in control. I'm not in control. Yeah, I almost want to pray, and, and I have. I prayed for people that God would do something to them. Put them in the hospital. Break their legs. Cripple them, Lord, if it would only wake them up to know you so that they could have eternal life. I would rather see someone lame and crippled and going to heaven than someone proud and arrogant and going to hell and even blessed and rich. Now, is that a bad thing to pray? How much is their soul worth? God sent his son to die on the cross for their soul. It's worth a lot. He didn't wish it on them that they'd break their legs. No, he broke the legs of his own son. He opened the skin of his own son. He allowed them to pierce him, put thorns on him and beat him. That's a loving, caring God. Doesn't wish harm on anyone. I'm not God. (laughs) And there are times that I pray for people that I love very dearly. Lord, put them in a position that they'll call out to you. And in this case, this person was in a position there. They were very open to the gospel, very open to spiritual things. And it was an opportunity for us to share with them. Ultimately, their trees, their pride, their money, their jobs, their education can't help them. Those are all idols if you're depending in them. But where is your God that you have made? what he said why will you plead with me you all have transgressed against me says the lord in vain i have chastised your children they receive no correction your sword has devoured your prophets like a destroying lion you kill those men that are telling you the truth oh generation see the word of the lord have i been a wilderness to israel or a land of darkness why do my people say we are lords We will come no more to you. Can a virgin forget her ornaments or a bride her attire? Can a a bride forget her wedding dress? Has has that ever happened? (laughs) Can you imagine that? You know, the song comes and here comes the bride. It's like, where's your dress? Oh, I forgot to put it on. That doesn't happen. We, We can't do that. Yet my people have forgotten me days without number. How can we forget God? It's so easier to forget God than our wedding dresses. Why do you beautify your way to seek love? Therefore you have also taught the wicked woman your ways. Also on your skirt is found the blood of the lives of the poor innocent. I have not found it by secret search, but plainly on all these things. In other words, you do it so openly that nobody can miss it. Yet you say, because I am innocent, surely his anger shall turn from me. Oh, but you're a gracious God, and you won't judge us. You're loving, and you'll forgive us, because where grace is, you know, where sin is, grace much more abounds, and that's what he's saying here. And that's true, but it's sad that we take that position. Because I'm innocent, surely his anger shall turn up from me. Behold, I will plead my case against you, because you say I have not sinned. Why do you gad about so much to change your way? Also, you shall be ashamed of Egypt, as you were ashamed of Assyria. Indeed, you will go forth from him with your hands on your head, for the Lord has rejected your trusted allies, and you will not prosper by them. Can you imagine Jeremiah sharing this message with Judah? You have to be strong to do something like that. You have to have the Lord to do something like that. 
you have to know that God has called you into the ministry to people like that, you know. And you have to trust in God completely, no matter what anyone else says. That's when you know you're called to God. You know, God has called us all into the ministry in one way or one form or another. Before you were in your mother's womb, He has a plan for you. Every one of us has a purpose in this world. And it's not just to be born, to go to school, get a job, and have children, and die. That's not why we were created. There's a purpose behind that. A plan for your life that he has marked out. And it doesn't matter what it is. It could be a school teacher, a Christian school teacher. It could be an usher. It could be a Someone parking the cars. It could be someone that cleans here. All those things are done for the Lord. You know, I think of our sister Rebecca and, and those that, that come from this, this home over here that have some sort of handicap. But you know, she comes here three times a week. She's here on Mondays and she is vacuuming and cleaning uh, scrubbing the toilets, putting stuff away, laughing, enjoying it, kidding with me. I kid back with her. And then she's here on Wednesdays. She does it all over again. You know, it, it, she's in charge of the cleaning ministry. And then she's here on Fridays again. And she does all of that all over again. I wish I had 10 of her because she has a heart to serve God. A heart. That is her calling. That is her purpose. God is using her, and she is faithful to do that. Yeah, she's got some issues. <laughs> yeah, because there's something, you know, that that isn't quite there because of whatever in the past or dysfunction. But boy, she loves serving the Lord, and because of her faithfulness, God is going to bless her for that. She's probably going to have more rewards than a lot of other people I know that don't do a thing for the Lord. We need to find a calling. What has God called us? And then be faithful to that calling that God has called us to. That is so important in this day and age. Father in heaven, we thank you, Lord, for your word. The example of Jeremiah, Lord, and the calling upon his life, upon the apostle Paul. Uh, we see it throughout all the scriptures, Lord God. You have called us. There, there is no doubt, Lord God. And the message that we preach, Lord Jesus himself said that we should rejoice when we are persecuted for righteous sake, Lord. He said that fathers and mothers and brothers and sisters will hate you because of me. These are things that are evidence of our salvation because we will not waver from the truth of the gospel message, Lord. The truth of what you have given to us as people, Lord. And so we will have enemies, Lord, as just part of the call, Lord. And in fact, it's evidence of the call, Lord God, that there will be those that just don't like us, Lord God. And yet, we'll have families, as Jesus said, who is my mother, who is my brother, who is my sister, but those who do the will of my Father in heaven. Lord, I thank you for your word and the truth that's there, and the evidence, Lord, that takes place in our very lives as we serve you, Lord. The word alive, it truly is alive, Lord. May it convict every heart. May it go out, Father. And may it do what you called it to do, Lord. Whether to correct or discipline or to encourage, but always, Lord, to draw us closer to you, Lord. May we look at our lives. May we ask ourselves, are we going our way? Then we need to stop and go God's way. Speak to us very clearly, Lord. Through your Holy Spirit, Father. That we may better serve you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.